be paying for freedom and the ability to speak freedom freely in a democracy. Now I have defined a democracy, and there will be people who agree with me and others who won't, as a safe place to be stupid. Now this is no reflection on the guest speaker, it's just a statement that in a lot of places around the world, being stupid is a very unhealthy thing. You can't be stupid in Iran. You can't be stupid in Russia. You can't be stupid in Cuba. It's getting to the point, you can't even be stupid in Quebec. Because what that means is, one person's common sense is another person's stupidity. If you can stand up and not worry about what your point of view is in an open and free society, then it doesn't matter what your, what your opinion is because you're free to hold it. Because somebody out there somewhere is going to think it's a stupid idea, no matter what it is, no matter how much well-grounded and common sense it is. So the next guest speaker is Connie Fournier, who her and her husband ran uh, freedominion.ca, I believe his name of it, and had it shut down because they dared to voice an opinion that the people, the mind police, didn't think was appropriate, didn't, wasn't politically correct. From their perspective, it was stupid. Now, I like to think that Canada is still enough of a democracy where that should not be something we have to worry about. And when it becomes something we need to worry about, we need people like Connie to stand up and speak for us in ways that we can't. So I would like to invite up Connie Fournier. By the bottom. So good morning. Mark and I are thrilled. Slide your hand right down. Slide your hand right down. That's it. Is that better? Yes. Uh, all right. Good morning again. Good morning. <laughs> Mark and I are thrilled to be here at uh, the St. Patrick's Day brunch. We were here last year and we had such a great time, and, and so we're really excited to come back again this year. We've been through a lot of ups and downs this year, and uh, many of the people in this room have been so supportive and encouraging. So we want to thank Canadians for Language Fairness for, for having us here and, and, and for being behind us and having our backs all this time as well. Now, I'd like to uh, start today with a bit of good news, because I'm going to have a bit of bad news. But the good news is, for those of you who've been following our cases, uh, our copyright case is over. Um, <laughs> the better news is that we won. Good. Um, <laughs> yes, uh, the National Post and Richard Warman discontinued their appeal at the very last minute, and so that means that we win and they have to pay us costs. Yay. Yay. <laughs> Interestingly, did, we did this by ourselves without a lawyer, and uh, so the money that they give us we can use in our other four cases. Um, yeah. So anyway, for any of you that were starting to wonder if anybody could ever beat Richard Warman in court, um, there's the good news. Okay, and we did. <laughs> Well, I'm sure many of you will remember the fight over Section 13 of the Canadian Human Rights Act. When we discovered how it was being abused and used to silence legitimate political speech online, we fought. A lot of us did. As Mark Stein said recently, when the attacks started on him in McLean's magazine, Ezra Levant advised him to go nuclear. Well, he went on to say that that is Ezra's advice in every situation including parking tickets and, and other things. <laughs> but in that case, it was the exact right thing to do. Well, we had already discovered this ourselves uh, because we received a Section 13 complaint against us, and we went as public as possible, as quickly as possible. And we renounced the law, and we wrote about it, and we went on radio shows and television shows, and, and as a result, they backed down on the complaint. But we could all see at that time, despite the fact that they backed down, that uh, we all needed to work together to get the word out to our fellow Canadians and to our members of Parliament that Section 13 had to go. 
And as a result of all of the work that we did last summer, Section 13 was repealed in the House of Commons. Now I'm reminding you of that story because I'm going to suggest to you today that it's time once again for us to go nuclear. You see, the same people who thought it was okay to use Section 13 to muzzle our political speech have now found an excellent tool in defamation law and are using it for the same ends. The proof that just about everyone I can think of that was vocal in their opposition to Section 13 is now embroiled in at least one defamation suit. Ezra is in several. Mark Stein has been sued by a global warmist. Kathy Shadle and her husband were both sued. Kate McMillan, LifeSite News, and the list goes on. Free Dominion has been sued five times, and we've received a decision in one of them that forced us to close the site to the public after 13 years. In that case, the judge gave an injunction to the plaintiff that forbids us from publishing anything about him that was found to be defamatory. Well, since the current case law considers us publishers of the comments of the others, even anonymous posters, and since we've had plenty of experience with anonymous trolls on our site in the past, including the plaintiff, we knew it would be just a matter of time until someone sneaked in and wrote something that violated the injunction. And for any of you that know anything about the law, that means a contempt of court charge and possibly jail. So yes, we could now go to prison if someone else wrote something negative about a government employee on our site. So we closed our site for our own protection. But we obviously can't let this stand, so we filed our notice of appeal, and, uh, and we're going to appeal that. So why is defamation law such a useful tool for censors? Well, it's because it's so subjective, for one thing. If the judge wants to nail you, he can rely on decisions like Hill versus Scientology or Vigna versus Levant. If he wants to let you off, he simply needs to cite Simpson versus Wick Radio. Your defenses can be upheld or dismissed based on how the judge feels about you at the time. Needless to say, I can't think of one case for internet defamation where a right winger walked. Now we came close because we won a defamation case against a blogger named Dr. Dog, but he appealed it, of course. Um, Incidentally, that appeal is going to be held in Ottawa on, on uh, March 24th to the 26th coming up. So if you want to come, talk to us after. In case you think that my assessment of defamation law is just the rambling of a court loser with sour grapes, I'd like to share with you a couple of excerpts of a position paper written by the Ontario Civil Liberties Association on the subject. They say that the proposed government legislation to clamp down on defamation suits designed to stifle political de debate, also called slap suits, strategic litigation against public participation. They say that proposed law doesn't go far enough and that the whole tort of defamation needs to be abolished, like Section 13 was. So if you can just bear with me, I'm going to read their words because they say it so well. The Ontario Civil Liberties Association. <clears throat> they say the common law of defamation has survived from criminal statutes of the past era that were designed to protect mo nobility from criticism. It is the only common law tort where damages, actual damage to the reputation, and malice are assumed and need not be proven in court. The result is a presumption of guilt. And that presumption of guilt can only be overturned if the defendant can prove one of the available defenses. The tort of defamation is incompatible, they say, with the right to free expression enshrined in the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms and should not have standing in Canada in modern times. They say presumptions of fals falsicity, malice, and damages should be abolished. They go on to say defamation law is structured such that if a complaint of criticism, comment, or opinion is ruled by the court, 
to have the tendency to reduce the social reputation of the plaintiff in the mind of a fictitious, reasonable person, then damage to the reputation is assumed and a financial reward of damages is due even in the total absence of evidence of actual damage to reputation. So you can see how broad that is. Anything that you write that could possibly lower this reasonable person's um, opinion of the person that you've written about, is it, it meets that test. Sure, you're going to be locked up. You yeah. are, too. <laughs> <laughs> you two don't laugh. I'll go with you. <laughs> and they don't have to, to show any kind of uh, damage, like a loss of employment or loss of income, or um, if they're an artist, a loss of fans, anything like that. Um, criticism complained of is all that's needed to obtain damages, and guilt is automatic. So they go on to say that there's no practical need for the tort of defamation because there are other common law torts that sufficiently protect against the unjustified attacks to personal reputation. And these ones correctly require proof of harm and malice. So they could use the tort of malicious falsehood or intentional infliction of mental suffering, conspiracy harm, um, things like that instead. Furthermore, defamation law is critically flawed by being heavily and structurally biased in favor of those with power and money, both individuals and corporations, including individuals supported by powerful institutions. And that's becoming really obvious these days. The most obvious source of bias is that rich individuals can most afford litigation, using the most successful lawyers too. A defamation lawsuit can cost a million dollars to litigate. In addition, damages are awarded in proportion to the value of the plaintiff's reputation as perceived by the judge. So the rich and powerful individuals are judicially determined to have reputations of high monetary value, values needing large reparations when they're found to be damaged. So they sort of finish up by saying there should be no room whatsoever for the tort of defamation in a free democratic modern society. With such a malleable tool in the hands of human judges and juries, most trials turn out to be exercises in punishing the insolent, protecting the powerful, cooling the mark out, removing the politically incorrect, reinforcing society's taboos, engaging a